I am the 2015 Indiana Teacher of the Year and a national finalist. I live in West Lafayette, Indiana, right by Purdue University. And I was a career English teacher at the high school level. And now I lead a program that supports new teachers in my district. My name is Darion Cockrell. I go by Mr. DC. I'm a physical educator at Crestwood Elementary School where I've been for nine years. I'm also uh, Missouri's 2021 Teacher of the Year, our state's black, uh, our, our state's first black male Teacher of the Year. I am so glad to finally meet you because what no one else would ever know except for us and one young teacher whose life got happier because of your help was that when I was um, helping teachers right after COVID, Darian, mm -hmm. I reached out to you for an idea of how to help a brand new teacher navigate teaching gym with all the COVID restrictions. And you were amazingly helpful. What, what drives your passion to help others? Um, I think the thing that drives my passion the most is that, you know, growing up the way that I did uh, with a very bad, bad background, a lot of disadvantages, I had a lot of support once I got into education. You know, when I got into the right school system, I had a lot of amazing educators who just did everything they could to support me and push me to be the man that I am today. And I feel like because of all of their love and generosity, I want to continue to push that forward and be that same person. So, you know, I am what they say, um, what they call a yes man. And my wife always tells me I'm a people pleaser. And it's just, I just want to make everyone happy and smile because I know how it is to not have that, you know, light in those people in your corner. So I'm always just looking for a way to help others. That's awesome. I knew that the first time we connected and it's great to hear, hear that passion in your voice. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I also want to say, you know, as a person who, you know, Early on in my education career, not even education, but just after I graduated and I was just trying to get a job, one of my first jobs was a paraprofessional. And I'm so grateful to have been in that position because it's not only had me allowed me to have a better respect for paraprofessionals and just the special needs group as a whole, but just as someone with special needs, how have you been able to navigate such an amazing educational career, you know, in your position? Yeah, and 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 it's been an interesting ride. So I'm blind and I was born with perfect vision and started losing it slowly around age seven. Um, so I, I experienced the whole range of things. I had perfect vision, I had partial vision, I had declining vision, and now I'm totally blind. And what that did, what that was really, really cool, is it put me in the path of teachers in, in an even more intense way than I would have had if I were just a regular gen ed um, kid with you know no disability going on because at various times my vision would drop and so teachers would have to help me read things to me enlarge things I I clearly remember teachers writing things out in in thick black marker on mm -hmm. bright white paper so that I could see the contrast and as those teachers came beside me as my vision drops. I had the opportunity to fall in love with them and the and the educational process and the whole profession became this thing where I knew no matter what my disabilities were, I could help others the way that those teachers helped me. So I, I don't know, like when I think of my classroom experience as an English teacher at the high school level, I think that a lot of my best teaching practices were things that I did maybe because I'm blind, uh, but yes. they were they were good teaching practices anyway. And then I just had that, I don't know, I don't know how to say empathy um, only, but just that awareness that everybody is carrying something. And mine happens to be a sensory disability, but everyone is carrying something. And so you start with that as your default assumption and you find a way in, just like you do with connecting with the students who have come from all different kinds of backgrounds and, and just giving them a hand up, walking beside them. That's, isn't that the privilege of education to have that opportunity to do that? 
It is most definitely is. And the key word you just used was empathy. And that's something I'm going to talk about in my session at this year's 2024 National Teachers of the Year Conference in Denver, which I'm so excited to be a speaker at. But, you know, I talk about empathy and how it's important that we all as educators, but just as human beings, continue to practice that. I think that's something that this world is really, really struggling with. And I think when we can be more cognizant about using empathy it just makes everything so much better you have a better understanding of people where they come from what they want to do and just how to relate and just build those relationships yeah and it, it is all about relationships uh, i now lead a program that helps new teachers and every time that i meet one of those new teachers for the first time i remember myself as a teacher in that first year and and it was, it was some bad stuff. I was not, I was not, I wasn't doing well. And, and part of that was just the, the newness of teaching. And part of that was figuring out how to be a blind teacher in a public, um, public school sighted classroom. And I wished so much back then that I had somebody who would be that non-judgmental, um, compassionate helper and now I have that honor to be that for others. And, you know, it, it's all about those relationships. It's about the connections. And in my session at the 2024 National Teacher Leadership Conference in Denver, I'm going to blend the, all of that together about how our stories are unique and those, those elements of our stories, how they influence what we do now tied to what we did back then and what we'll do tomorrow. At the same time, as I look at disability issues and also yes. that, you know, that that whole piece of uh, new teachers entering the field and how to keep them here when there's so much turnover and so much burnout. Um, it's a it's it's an opportunity that we all have as experienced teachers um, to to stand beside the new generation of teachers and help them help them learn and grow and stay. You, you know, you talk about burnout and uh, I just did, a, um, I spoke to some teachers a couple of weeks ago and one of the people in the audience, they asked me like, hey, you know, so how do you as a person, you know, with all these awards and things like that, what can you say about teachers and burnouts and, you know, how can you push it forward and like prevent this? And I say, you know, I think as an educator, uh, we need to also remember that we're more than just educators, okay? Mm -hmm. We are more than just educators and we have to get to a place where we have to change that narrative. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I understand that there's so many things going on in, in education and a lot of these issues can cause people to not want to be educators anymore. But I think the, the thing that separates good educators from great educators is their ability to take these connections and use this empathy to change that narrative about it being a bad workplace and doing what they can to make it a better place for everyone to, to be in. You know, like you talk about in yours, how um, believing when you cannot see, all right, and becoming that light. We all should be becoming that light for everybody, for our students, uh, for the legislators, for our states, for the parents, uh, for everybody. And I think, you know, using empathy, using these relationships and just using our abilities as educators and understand that with the heartbeat of our communities, we can change that narrative. You got it. You are absolutely correct. because you know, we tend to find what we seek. And so if we dwell too long on all the things that are wrong about the educational system and the compl complexities in our profession, then we're gonna find evidence after evidence after evidence of um, all, the, all the things that, that are not perfect. Yep. And yet while we're looking that direction, we're, we're not looking the direction of our kids and our colleagues and our communities that really need us to be as focused on um, the possibilities, the the future, you know, that that believing when you cannot see comes from a quote that I had read a long time ago that uh, even in the valleys, you still must believe in the mountains. And that's that, mm. you know, we're 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 in the hard place. We know that we can acknowledge that and we simultaneously know that there are better things. And we we have that chance to direct our kids' gazes, our parents, our, our colleagues, all that, direct them to those mountains and that, that way up. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, you're the 2015 uh, Teacher of the Year for the state of uh, Indiana, right? Right. So 
when you first got that call or got that, you know, that email, that tweet or whatever it was to let you know that you just won, take me through that experience. Ah, those feelings. So, <laughs> so I'll be candid. I almost <laughs> withdrew. I almost withdrew from the process. Um, what? After, uh, yeah, because um, that gigantic imposter syndrome and and oh, yeah. also the voices of um, some colleagues over the years who every time I would win an award or get an opportunity who would, you know, a few of them mumble behind closed doors that I was getting those opportunities because I was blind and it was like a charity gift. So those voices, you know, they live, they live large that we, our brains hold the negative so much easier than our brains hold the positive. That's why we need, we need intention for our focus and all of that. But yeah, when, I, so Indiana narrows it down to 10, um, then we have live interviews and then, you know, you're in the three when somebody shows up uh, to do a surprise observation and um, I was okay for most of that, but after I, I was, a th I found out I was in the top three when they walked in my room at 7.30 a.m. on a Monday morning in my class of 36 seniors in senior composition. And uh, my kids were amazing. My students really rose up. But after that, and I, after I was contemplating, what if I happened to be chosen? Um, I came very close to calling and, and asking them to withdraw my name. And I didn't because a friend told me that there's there's a purpose. You don't have, you're not the best teacher when you're named teacher of the year. You're a teacher serving a role to advocate, um, to give hope, um, to inspire, and um, to speak for those who don't have that platform. And in that light, I chose to stay in. How about you? What was your- And, and not to cut you off, but how blessed we are today that uh -huh. you did not, you know, step out of that role and I'm so glad that you stayed in it because we won't be talking right here today and you will not have impacted so many more educators so just thank you thank you thank you for just staying in that light and being the person that you are and sticking with it we appreciate that yeah thank you and you know we all have those moments where we're trying to figure out the why and sometimes yeah. um sometimes we don't have that why sometimes it's that like that believing when you don't see you know it's um it's trusting that there is a why. And so you yes. keep going and you're doing your best. So what did, what happened for you when you found out? Oh my God. So oh, there's so many layers. We're going to start here. So I remember the way that we do it in the state of Missouri is they, they announce it on Twitter and uh, they do the eight finalists. And of course my name was the eighth one. So when they <laughs> got to about the sixth or seventh one, I just say, you know what? I'm turning off my phone. I know I didn't make it. This was a fun run. It is what it is. So I finally turned my phone back on and it's just blowing up. It's blowing up. And I'm like, oh man, what is going on? And then I find out I'm one of the finalists. So let's fast forward it, right? We do the interviews, we do all these things. And as I'm going through like regional and I'm learning all these things about all these other educators, I'm like, there is no way I'm going to win. Like, I'm just along for the ride. I'm enjoying the free food, the cocktails, like all the fun. Like, I'm like, I'm never going to, I'm never going to win this. I'm just a PE teacher. You know, it is what it is. Now, I'll never forget the morning when I was outside. I was doing, uh, I used to do a uh, parent drop off. So the kids, they drop off the parent, the, the parents drop off the kids and I'm out there on my radio. I'm singing, I'm dancing. I'm having a good time. I'm welcoming my students into my school. And then uh, I get a call from the front office, like, hey, the principal wants to see you. And then, of course, the kids are joking, like, oh, Mr. DC, you're in trouble. And I'm just like, yeah, 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 whatever. I get up to the office, and then the principal tells me, so we had a parent complaint about uh, your music this morning. And I'm just thinking, like, oh, my God, all my music is clean. I play kids, Bob. Like, what is going on? So now I'm thinking about every parent, like, oh, it must have been his parent because they don't like me. Or, oh, I seen his parent looking at me funny. And I'm trying to figure out which parent is upset. And here my assistant principal is telling me, like, yeah, they said you, you know, had this type of language. Or now we got to go talk to the superintendent and this and that. And I'm like, I just want teacher of the year for my school. Like, now I'm in trouble. Like, what is going on? I was so embarrassed. And I was just mortified. And then she flips it on me. She was like, and just so you know, you know, she said, you know, DC, I know you've had a lot of interviews and stuff lately. And the news is coming to interview me today. You know, you got any tips or pointers or anything? I'm like, no, I don't care about that. Like, I don't want to be in trouble. Like, what? who cares about these tips and pointers? And I should have known, known something was up because the day before, they sent me an email saying, Mr. DC, you cannot go outside and use the field because they're doing something uh, to the grass. 
And I'm thinking like, this has never happened. What do you mean they're doing something to the grass? What is that? You know what I mean? So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to take my kids out at the end of the day and then I'll sneak out. So as I'm sneaking out with my students, the assistant principal <laughs> runs down and intercepts me and takes me up to the office to let me know I'm about to have a meeting with the superintendent. I'm in trouble. All these bad things are going to happen. And then, um, so they take my students. I didn't notice at the time, but the entire school was in the back of the school. My friends, my family, the news, everyone was out there. I had no idea. I'm in the office. I'm talking to the principal, like almost probably in tears because I'm like, I'm going to get in trouble. Like, this is like, this is not fair. Like, I didn't play bad music. Like, what is going on here? So as she's talking to me and she's uh, walking me back outside to my students, she's saying, you know, uh, I, I just need advice on how to talk to the press. And I'm just trying to figure out, like, why do you want advice from me? You just told me I'm in trouble. Like, I don't care about this advice right now. And we're walking out and I see all the kids. And I see the news people, but it's still not clicking. And I'm like, oh, what's going on? And I'm like, hey, the news people are right here. Why are we walking past them? Like, don't you need to go have an interview with them? And then I see the sign that says, congratulations, Darian Cockrell, Missouri Teacher of the Year. <laughs> and it's still not clicking. And I'm like, wait, what, what, what? And then my wife comes around the corner holding my son, screaming, baby, you won. And then that's when the tears start falling down. And my first emotion, I kid you not, was immediate fear because mm. I knew, you know, like, I'm, I'm like, oh my God, one, I just won. Two, I'm a black man and I just won. Three, I'm like, I don't want to speak in front of people. I don't know how to speak in front of people. I was just thinking all the worst things, all the worst things. And I just did not feel prepared, but I will tell you that going through this journey, learning so much about myself, learning so much about just education as a whole, not just what was going on in my classroom, but just our entire state and our country has changed me so much and gave me so many tools and the strength and the confidence to just be a better educator and better advocate for myself, for my students, for the community that I serve. And even though this journey had so many ups and downs, I will not change it for the world. It's been one of the greatest things to have ever happened to me. And I'm just so blessed to have the opportunity to continue pushing education forward and just speak life into what we do because it matters and it's so impactful. And even though we don't get as recognized as we should, um, I think it's important that we continue to love each other and recognize each other and just let us know that we're more than just educators. That's an amazing story. And, it, you know, it, it's so powerful that we are aware, not just of the opportunities we have, but of the the differences that we can make without ever even knowing about it. So yes. I, I, yeah, I just had this, the craziest thing earlier this week, I got an email from a young man who now lives in Boston, who was in the audience um, for an event that I did in 2019. I love public speaking. And I, I, uh, through different connections, I was uh, a headline speaker at a sales conference for wow. high tech. So it was all of these, yeah, young people with their Starbucks and their their technology <laughs> and all of that. And here I'm the teacher of the year or whatever, you know, and I got up and I, I remember the speech. It was really powerful. It was really cool. It was impactful. But that's five years ago that I did that speech. And I got an email on Monday from a guy who was in the audience who told me that 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 he was so skeptical when I started talking, like, why was I at that convention? Yeah. And something that I said in that speech stayed with him so, so profoundly and he has never let it go. And, and he wanted to tell me about it. So I Googled him a little bit and he actually referenced the, the point that he talked about that stayed with him from my speech. He referenced it in a media story um, that he would, he arranged a food drive and referenced it to that wow. reporter and it just amazes me because, you know, when we are in the place we are meant to be, the kinds of things that can come out of that, the changes, the impacts, we just need to believe in them, even when we can't see them. And, and the whole National Teacher Leadership Conference is all about believing, keeping believing, keep on believing, no matter what, you have to believe that that good is happening, that we're all in yeah. a role for a reason, and that we can do it. You exemplify that, Darian. You are. Thank you. you you're you're just an, an icon to me, and it's so girl. Cool. Stop. No, you are. You are the. I mean, I'm I'm reading all the list of all the stuff that you got going on. You are the icon. What are you talking about? 
You know what? Hey, let's go back to back at the National Teacher Leadership Conference. <laughs> want to do that? <laughs> oh, I, I do not want to follow you. I don't oh, do me on the end of the week when you're not even there anymore. Just I'll oh. pre-record it. No, I don't even want to do that. Uh, so tell me this, going to speak in front of our peers and stuff like that. And I know you've been you've been speaking publicly for a while. And you said that's something that you really enjoyed. And it's something I'm still figuring it out every time I do. And, I, and I'm and i starting to enjoy it, you know, and, and, you know, trying to figure out exactly how I want to do and say certain things and, you know, different antidotes and jokes and stuff like that. But do you ever get nervous still? I get nervous in front of one particular audience, which I think you will, I think you will find, um, I think you'll find kinship in it. The only audience that makes me nervous is when I'm talking to people who are blind and visually impaired. Mm. And um, it's a strange, it's a strange dichotomy because I am what they are. And I know that it is so important for me to um, recognize the, the, the humility, you know, to stand in the humility yes. and, and the bond and the, uh, there's a 70% unemployment rate among the blind and visually impaired. And here I am in this fairy tale life of mine. And um, I want to do it right. I want to do it right for the people I most want to, um, to walk beside. And so the, the weight of responsibility and importance that I feel in front of those audiences um, that's that's nerve wracking. And yet it's also a privilege. It's a privilege to feel that pressure. Um, and I and I'm glad to do it. And it's the hardest audience I ever face. You are literally giving me the chills right now because you are a blind white woman. I am a, a black. Teacher and I represent two percent of, you know, this profession, you know, of black men and the feelings that you have about, you know, the different people who relate to you are the same exact feelings that I have. Anytime I'm put in a position where I have to speak to people who look like me, sound like me, act like me, and who are me, it changes how I go about doing it because I'm like, I want to represent this the best way that I can. And I don't want anyone to look up here and think that I'm just a fool. You know what I mean? So I have those same feelings. And the fact that we have so much alike, this is crazy. I don't it know is. what's going on here. Did you uh, do this? It, it's Who did this? Me. Like, it, seriously, and, the stuff that we story. have in common, like, oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. The feelings, the emotions. They're on it. So this has been a tremendous conversation. And the next time we talk, we will be in the same room in Denver, Colorado uh, yes. in late July at the National Teacher Leadership um, Conference. And I cannot wait to shake your hand. Uh, to give you a big hug. I'm not going to give you a, a blind, a high five. Blind people are not very good at that, but we'll, we'll do the rest of it. And I can't, I can't wait. One of the highlights for me among many at that conference will be meeting you in person. Well, I can't wait either. Uh, this has been so tremendous. I appreciate you. God bless you. You are amazing. And I just keep doing amazing work. And I cannot wait to hear you speak in person. I cannot wait. I'm so pumped for it. Same. I've got a front row seat for yours. No, so. please don't go in the back. Do not <laughs> into no, no. Do not let her come in to me speaking. Please do, do not, not let the lady come him. in. <laughs> okay, time to end this interview. <laughs>